the Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z here, author of the Cannabis Business Book, and you're listening to the Cannabis Business Coach Podcast, where I chat with and coach the highest performing entrepreneurs in the cannabis industry. Hi, Mike Z is, hi, Mike Z is, hi, Mike Z is, the Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z here. And on today's episode of the Cannabis Business Coach Podcast, I'm joined by Justin Fisher, the CEO and co-founder of Risk Scout, which is not not entirely cannabis focused, but serves the cannabis industry in a very unique and important way, which is being the bridge between cannabis businesses and financial institutions and and being that compliant bridge more specifically. So Justin, I'm going to welcome you and ask you to introduce yourself, tell the folks about Risk Scout, and you're going to do it much more justice than I just (laughs) did in that, in that crummy intro, but uh, you know, please go, go, go for it. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to chat with you. I've um, followed you a lot and really enjoy your virtual happy hours and you know, all that you do. So thanks for that. Um, Yeah, look, hey, quick background. I'm a 20 year fintech veteran technology guy who's worked with banks for 20 years. And, um, you know, as of about, you know, about two, three years ago, some of my banks and some of my providers were saying, hey, you've seen what's been going on with cannabis banking. And I said, you know, I live in Texas, by the way. So Austin, it's a great town, but we're not big cannabis um, THC state yet or, or area. So you know, one of the things that they were sharing with me is, you know, a lot of the West Coast um, banks were, were literally hiring all these temps to try to, you know, collect all this material. And, you know, they, then they had to charge $5,000 a month for a checking account for THC. I mean, this was not that long ago, three, four years ago. And so um, we looked at that and said, hey, this is really more of a software issue and, you know, compliance and we could really help. And as that was our very early naive, as all founders do, kind of that's the idea, the thesis, right? And you go into it and you realize, wow, there's this whole ecosystem in this whole world. I mean, you read the book from uh, Safe Harbor Bank and you see all this, the great work that she's done. And, you know, so we started really touring the country. We made it to a lot of the MJ conferences. We did all that kind of world. And what we essentially came up with was, you know, we need to help banks with all high risk businesses. And to your point, you you said it well, is it's a bridge, right? Um, But it's not just um, compliance. What we find is it's also an education and understanding of this market, right? Um, and, you know, I think that sometimes guns are pointed from both sides and people don't have a coping conversation. So they don't really realize, you know, a banker doesn't realize that this person isn't, um, you know, isn't cartel, for example, which is what the federal government wants them to always to believe, right, um, in the past. And then, um, you know, the, the business doesn't believe the banker really cares about their business and everything they share is going to be used against them. And so it's, it's actually farther from the truth. You know, the bank wants you to do the right thing and they want to bank you because you're in their community, but they have to get to this place where they're comfortable with it, right? And so that's what that's the, the genesis of, uh, of Risk Out. And uh, we have a platform and some consulting to help financial services groups, you know, get to the education and, and set up those compliance workflows to make it, make it work. Amazing. Yeah. So it reminds me of a little bit of what I did and still do when I when I got involved in the space, which is trying to bring together these people that have maybe not the best impressions of each other and and view each other as as enemies or or have a combative kind of stigmatized vision of each other. When in reality, and this is something I, I preach all day, to succeed in the cannabis business, you really need both pieces of that equation. You need someone who really gets cannabis and you need someone who really gets business because there's not too many people, well, more and more every day now that really have a great understanding of both, but you need both of those pieces to succeed. So being that bridge or that intermediary that helps connect those groups that sometimes you know, look at each other with distrust or worse I think is a crucial, crucial piece of the cannabis economy. So I, I want to ask you, though, you, you mentioned it a little before when we spoke, uh, to just touch on some of the other industries and, and uh, sectors that you work with, because I, I think it's quite fascinating, some of these high-risk spaces. 
Yeah. So let's put it in perspective. If, if you and I were going to go, let's say, do something non high risk, like, you know, open up a hot dog stand, right? We got an LLC. You and I take our two IDs. We go into a bank. We show a formation and paperwork and we get a bank account. No big deal. Now, if all of a sudden our hot dog stand sending a bunch of wires to Russia, it's probably going to be an issue, right? Um, but, you know, because it does, it, it looks suspicious. But that's the nature of compliance for a, a, a we'll call it no risk or a low risk business, right? Um, when you talk about high risk, a lot of these, um, they make sense, but you don't always know. So for example, uh, independent ATM providers. So here in Austin, we have Sixth Street, real big popular party district. You can, you, you can literally throw a stone in any direction and hit an ATM that does not have a bank logo on it. Well, that's, that's a company, a guy runs and he feeds those ATMs. There's cash, there's the risk of getting robbed. There's, is he moving the cash from other, you know, ill-gotten means? Um, the key word is cash, by the way, in a lot of these industries, right? Because it's, it's where money laundering happens um, in terms of, you know, focus. So, you know, ATMs, independent ATMs are one, uh, money service businesses. So anywhere you get a check cashed or we're going to send money, you know, you know, truth be told, P2P, you know, like Venmo is, is, is really a money service business, right? Um, they have to have licenses in all the states. It's, it's you know, PayPal the same way. And so, um, you know, you know, those those are another one that we we tend to work with. And then, um, you know, the newest fun one is crypto. Um, cannabis is a lot of fun because there's always a conversation, but crypto is a whole interesting one. I mean, on one hand, you've got Visa and you've got um, PayPal and Elon and everyone else sort of putting these like massive endorsements behind cryptocurrency. On the other hand, you have a business who I just was talking to here in Texas who makes these little ATMs, basically Bitcoin terminals, who can't get a bank account. It's worse than cannabis because banks don't even understand. They're like, I don't even know what to do here. And so that's another potential sort of di dichotomy there where, again, you know, I talk to bankers and I say, what's your concern? And I'm like, wow, it's the dark web. And, you know, it's these places where these things happen. And it's like, again, a stigmatiz you know, stigmatization of that, that, that you know, person. But again, there are bad actors, right? In all of these industries, there's a bad actor at that hot dog stand, right? Things happen, um, you know, but, but ultimately, you know, the bank can get through that process. The other thing I want to tell you that a lot of people don't understand, and, and it's funny, every time I say this in front of a bank person in the BSA team, the, the Bank Secrecy Act team, they laugh and they go, you, you couldn't be more correct. And that is, there isn't a bank in the country who doesn't have an overwhelmed compliance officer, right? Usually a single person who's been there for 20, 30 years, whatever, who's trying to adapt, trying to deal with the volume, trying to deal with all these new threats, right? It's kind of like saying, your grandma is going to now run all of your personal security and your, you know, and I'm not saying that they're a grandma figure, but, you know, someone who, who, who's not necessarily, you know, probably really technical is now in charge of all your Wi-Fi security, all your passwords. I don't know about you, I love my grandma to death, but she has a book of all her passwords written down. She's not going to be, you know, um, in a good place there. So in general, that person is overwhelmed, you know, don't have the staff. And so then when all these new hemp businesses or cannabis businesses come in, the, the, the knee jerk reaction is I just can't, right? And so that's what that's what the market sees, right? Is they get kicked out or they get told no, and you know there's not a reason for that. So you know a big part of us helping is trying to create software solutions so that you know that poor person doesn't have to go home at night every you know every night thinking is there some hole in the in the system where I'm gonna you know risk the bank, right? Um, you know I don't know if you know this too. The last thing about this is that if you're an executive of a bank or a BSA officer of the bank, if you um, it, negligence is a very fine line. If you actually don't do reasonable processes, you can end up in, in jail, right? And so it does have an actual personal implication to their freedom, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's really a lot of stuff on the line versus just saying, you know what, go down to the bank across the street, or we're not going to do it. You know, there's plenty of other people who will serve you, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. And I guess by process of elimination, I'm the bad actor at the hot dog stand. <laughs> <laughs> but um on, on a serious note I, I i'm curious if you can share in in some more detail about the tools and solutions you provide via risk scout um to help make these daunting processes a little more manageable and and less uh less nerve-wracking for these compliance officers and and financial institutions yeah, so a bank, a bank will, uh, let's take THC since it's a common topic, right? Most, um, for, first of all, without the Safe Banking Act, there's no real regulations for the banks to follow. The, the FinCEN and the, the um, lots of other acronyms, FFIEC, OCC, FDIC, there's a ton of them that, that regulate banks and credit unions. They have not 
said, here's A to Z, what you have to do, right? You might know that there's SAR filing and there's a bunch of other stuff that's out there. They, they just do everything. In fact, I've been to multiple conferences where they literally say, track everything. Oh, that, yeah, track that too. Oh, that, no, that, that's a cannabis company. Like, you know, they just, they, they err on the side of, of do everything, which again means it's not aligned with that person's, you know, capacity. Um, so at the end of the day, I did a bunch of surveying with dispensary and cultivators in the space, um, mostly on the THC side. And they were all like, look, I'm making a ton of money. I'm doing really well. I'm super busy. However, I want to talk to you because I spend four hours a week managing my bank's requests, you know, faxing information back, dealing with their on-site reviews. Um, oh, they want COAs for every product now. <sighs> okay. You know, and they all understand and value the compliance aspect, like, you know, okay, I got to make sure that, you know, you see that I'm doing my metric submissions or that my POS is matching what the bank's record, but, but, you know, I'll give you a really great analogy. When I, when I was just becoming a professional, I went and bought a house in Austin. I did it the old way. I walked into a table, a branch, you know, and, and talked to the mortgage officer. I had a, usually have a folder here, but a, an inch folder. And I was like, here's all my information, right? What's in there? Personal finance, credit report, stuff about the house, essentially due diligence compliance about me. And can I afford this house? Right. Um, I just did two mortgages um, last year, just with two companies to compare, did them all on my phone. Now the process has actually gotten worse in terms of due diligence um, because, you know, 2007 and sort of, you know, the, the implications of credit and everything else, it was easier back when I did my first one. However, it was a lot easier on me as a business to provide that and to communicate, you know, with the bank. And so all we're talking about doing is in today's world, a, a business will literally bring that into a bank branch. And then when they need to provide stuff on a monthly basis, you can like fax it over, Dropbox it. The bank's trying to go through all of it, make sure it's all there. So we've built a whole workflow system that just keeps all that on track, right? And so you just get a nice alert. You can pick up your phone, take a picture of an invoice. Oh, you want a picture of my field? Here, I'll get that, put it down. We have a motto, the business does not need to spend time in the app. Answer the question, move on, right? And so that's really part of our process is to really reduce that time. And, and everyone acknowledges compliance is necessary. It's just, can we, can we improve the process? And then for the bank, um, Mike, I'll tell you, like, I've literally come around the, the desk at them and I've looked at their Outlook calendar and they have calendar appointments for everything they're trying to remember to do for every business. I mean, it's, it's insane, you know, like check that the, check their license hasn't expired, do this and look at their website, you know, call them on an onsite report. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, they need something. And so that's, again, it just comes from, you know, mothers, uh, you know, the, the necessity is a um, is, is, is the drive here, right? So what we're doing is to help them clear that, right? Um, so it's, it's an important aspect to take all this um, overhead off their plate. And, um, and then, you know, we also have compliance services. So if they don't really understand the rules and regulations or how to apply those, um, we help them with that as well. Got it. Well, I'm hearing all this. I'm certainly glad that I am not a bank compliance person. <laughs> um, Although that would be a disaster, whatever, whatever bank should, that would hire me to do compliance, please don't. Um, <laughs> let me ask you, I, I know there's, there's another product or, or I, I don't know if it's a standalone business that you launched or, or just a new offering uh, through Risk Scout, but something that's more for uh, business operators in cannabis that was another another issue that you came across and said, hey, there's a software solution that could be useful here. Yeah, yeah. So we have a, we have a product we've been running for the past two years called First Pass. And every time, a, um, let's say I'm, I'm working on your cannabis business and you submit your information to the bank, we do a business background check. So it's not individually did Mike have speeding tickets. It's you know, overall, is Mike really an owner of the business? Is, uh, is you know, Mike's business have a license in the state of New York? It's all of that detail. Um, you know, like in Texas right now, they're still fighting over smokable hemp, right? If we run a business in Texas, we, we will raise questions about smokable hemp. Now, again, we're not saying don't bank them. We'll just say, hey, keep an eye on this because currently it's in the gray zone, right? And the bank will work with the business to make sure that they're keeping an eye on that. Again, not a full decline, which is good, but also not a you know, ignorant acceptance either. Right. And so it's a business background check and it's, um, you know, it's, it's way beyond anything that's out there and it's, it's some peace of mind for the, for the, the business that's going to, you know, either underwrite your loan, do your bank account, you know, insurance, merchant account, what have you. But one of the things that came out right away was when we started sort of 
opening it up. Um, actually, we, we had a lot of requests over the last six months. Every time we talk about the product, you know, I'd have real estate brokers saying, man, you should see what's going on in, in the Bay Area. You know, we have this problem where, you know, one out of five customers, tenants, it comes to me, they're willing to pay cash 30% over asking, but they're cannabis related, right? He goes, and, and I got a gray haired, you know, generalization, but a gray haired owner who's like, I don't want anything to do with cannabis, right? And, and you know, that's actually also a theme in general, sort of baby out the bathwater. If it's anywhere near, I don't want anything to do with it. And so we've been able to educate these businesses, first of all, and there's different levels, plant touching, very, very plant touching, right? You're, you're literally, you know, crafting the product inside of a warehouse too. Maybe you're just, you know, related supplies or equipment, you know, or greenhouse lights, right? You know, there's, there's a different level, you know, of, of risk. And so then the question is, okay, I get that, Justin, but how do I know that, you know, Mike's business is just CBD and not THC? Well, you can run a first pass on Mike, right? And you can, ver you know, it's trust but verify, right? And so we've created an API in a console. So an API could be put into a commercial real estate system. You know, a, a law firm could just use the console and search, you know, search the information. Um, again, it's not a stocking app. You have to use it for a business purpose. Like I'm evaluating Mike for a lease or, you know, it's not just anybody can sign up, but um, we see a lot of different things. We, see, we have escrow companies that are testing and enjoying it. We have lenders, um, cannabis lenders, um, you know, on our network that are doing that. Of course, insurance, merchant processing, but, but also real estate, you know? And so uh, we even had businesses who've come in and applied and worked with the bank and they turn around and they go, hey, can I use Risk Scout to, to like work with my cultivators? They're a processor. And so they buy from five different cultivators, you know, every quarter. And they're like, I want to make sure that I'm validating that they, you know, I see their COA and it could be Photoshop by the way, but I'm, I'm, I want to validate that they are who they say they are and they have a license, right? Um, so that's, that's where FirstPass came about. And we're really excited to see all the different sort of applications people can use for it, you know? Yeah, awesome. And where does somebody go to go and get access to that and to run to run a review or I don't know if that's the appropriate. Yeah, that's exactly term. right. Yeah. A review or report. Yeah. So they can just go to riskout.com slash first pass. Awesome. All right, cool. I, I got to check out this Mike guy. I don't know. I've heard some mixed things about him. I got to look into it. <laughs> we'll find some interesting things. <laughs> uh -oh. I hope not. I hope it's actually completely boring. Um, <laughs> that's why I got Mickey Mouse back there. Cause you know, that that's, that's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be like Mickey, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, you know, family friendly, but, um, let me ask you, I'm, I'm curious, you know, being in Texas, which is obviously not the legal cannabis capital of the world, you know, just, I'm, I'm curious, what's your sense of, is, is there an appetite there for, for the market? Is, is there any change in, in the social climate? Um, you know, and I understand Austin is different from probably many parts of Texas, but I, I'm just curious. I've never even been to Texas other than a layover. So I, I'm just curious, you know, what is, what's the, what's kind of the sense of things over there as it relates to cannabis? Yeah. Well, first of all, you need to come and I will host you. Right. So um, we're big on hospitality, come to Austin, do some live music, plenty of food. You'll eat a lot. So um, yeah, no, look, it's a great question. Um, you know, I will say, I'll say it in a couple of different ways. Number one, like a lot of, um, you know, majority red states, we, we have this sort of conservative um, contra flow to, to THC, right, especially. But what's been fascinating is to see that industrial hemp is taking off, right? Um, and there's a lot of open arms for it. And a lot of farmers here who have been losing, including, I, I'm actually a fourth generation farmer. My family has had farm for, you know, since Texas was a state. And um, we became unsuccessful doing commercial produce. It's just, I mean, there's a lot of stories about how you, you got to have a huge amount of, you know, um, planting space. You got to have, got to go organic, right? In order to make money. But now my dad, who's in his late sixties is like, Hey, I'm going to grow hemp. And I'm like, what do you know about that? But it's great to see, you know, it's very, there's very open culture. Our head of agriculture is like, look, let's grow hemp and THC. No big deal. You know? And uh, he's a pretty conservative guy. Um, I think there's two camps. I think there's the, the holdouts, right? The stigmatized holdouts, if we want to use that term again. And then there's the, there's the open-mindedness. And I think that's starting to win in the sense that look, tax revenue, right? Um, you can drive, 
over the border from here about three and a half hours through Oklahoma and you can you can buy your THC, right? Guest permit in Oklahoma. New Mexico just approved, right? So, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of those things, I think the pressure is coming economically. Um, and I think the open-minded groups are gonna, you know, gonna win out. We have one of the worst compassionate, you know, medical use programs right now. Um, with a lot of people lobbying, a lot of very important proof, but I think it's gonna matter. I think the economics are gonna move it over. Um, and I don't think Texas does wants to be in the laggard of, of legalization, right? And so what other, the other states are doing is really opening it up. Um, so that's my take on it. What's what's fascinating is I think we're we're actually right at a year now since we opened up the program for industrial hemp, and we have over 1,300 licensed hemp farmers. You know, not much of a crop last year because they got the licenses pretty late and with the pandemic. But you know, it's amazing. And I was in the middle of Dripping Springs, which is just south of Austin. It's a very conservative area, right? And um, you can see, you know, at Tejas Hemp, you can see this like this field's right on the highway, right? course you know great uh aroma you got you know you got the plant growing right there and you know ask a few people that are kind of in the neighborhood and they're like yeah it's great you know totally understand him don't have any problem with thc i just think this is where it's going you know and so i really think that on the surface level it's the it's the laggard you know um i'm sorry the uh, stigmatized you know red red wave on the on the on the real sort of grassroots we're seeing a lot of people a lot more open to it and and you know public opinion swaying things the other way Awesome. Well, I think, you know, New York for many years had a, a I'm, I'm just going to be blunt, terrible compassionate care program, one of the most restrictive, not quite as terrible as Texas, but almost like a surprisingly bad medical program. And the adult use program that we just passed is being applauded as, you know, a, a potentially new gold standard for adult use legalization. So I I have a good feeling that once Texas does come around, just given the, you know, the business friendly nature of the state, I think it's going to be an incredible market down there. So, you know, it's ju just a matter of time, I think. Yeah. Uh, Justin, I let me ask you, what has surprised you most about the cannabis industry since you've been engaged in it yeah that's a good question um oh i'll tell you it's really wild from my perspective you know like 2019 before the pandemic shutdowns i made it to money 2020 which is the traditional i mean very progressive technology but but traditional bank conference right and you know it's probably 60 70 percent of people are wearing suits and ties and it's, it's what you imagine of bank conferences um with a little bit of flair you know um but you know, then I got to go, I got to go to Vegas the, the month after and make the MJ bids conference. Right. And it's like, you know, whoa, it's amazing. What I think like everybody, I try to keep an open mind on, on, on everything. Right. I don't know about much about the market, but you know, you come with again, so this, the stigma, right. Of like, you know, who, who are the people, you know, behind these, um, these companies. And I, I'll tell you, you know, it, it felt like there were, you know, I, I assume this, there were some enthusiasts, but you know, there were people who were trying to make a buck on the cannabis space, right? There were a lot of um, deal, what I call deal guys, right? VCs who are trying to make a buck. And look, they're, they're always going to be there. They're going to be on every boom industry that's out there. But I was pleasantly surprised to meet a lot of VCs, a lot of businesses, a lot of people who are, who are really coming from, you know, a knowledge source and a source of truth of, of trying to bring the plant um, in the right way to the public, right? And um, I really, that's what surprised me the most is seeing how much support, how much of a, of a network there really was. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of ways to go, um, you know, especially in the, in the diversity side as well. Um, but I, I do like what I see with people, you know, people coming to it. And that's so many brilliant people in, in so many different ways. I learned, you know, I was surprised about the, the testing equipment and, um, you know, the analysis and all of these different things that people are doing. And so, um, you know, I think, I think for me is just, you have this assumption about cannabis. Everyone does. I mean, you know, I actually have a shirt that I wear to money 2020 that says, you know, cash isn't a problem, you know, 99 problems, but cash isn't one. And uh, it's uh, it's literally like cannabis banking and, you know, I'm, I'm stopped everywhere. Right. And it's not, Hey, you know, what are you doing here? Da, da, da. It's like, ah, let's talk about this. Right. Um, I, I gotta tell you this quick story. I walked into the, the, the elevator with this shirt on and again, it's a t-shirt in the sea of, of suits. Right. And, um, you know, the guy stops me and he's like, Hey, let's tell me about this. Like, what would you, and I look at his badge and he's at, um, Navy federal 
And that's not a not an institution that's you know anywhere close to being aligned to this. Not not because they don't necessarily have the internal perspective. They just don't have a charter towards to this to businesses in this way. So and he goes, yeah, yeah, no, no. Look, I'm I'm actually involved in cannabis businesses because I've got a buddy from college who runs one. It's an amazing business. And I love doing it. I love seeing the impact the plant makes to it. And and then just the whole elevator, like in one way or another, is handing me a card or wanting to talk about it. And I just love how interested people are, and not in a not in a you know a stigma way, right? In a way that's like I want to learn about this and understand it. Um, and it's actually tenfold since the Senate confirmations in January. I mean. You know, a lot of people are kicking tires, but they want to learn and they're open to learning. And I think, you know, um, that's a part for me that's I'm always chasing in this space is how do we provide education? How do we continue to, um, you know, I actually just shot some showcase videos of local hemp and CBD businesses in Texas just to put a face and a name with a business, not a, not a, you know, oh, this is a smoke shop or this is just this or this or that. Not that there's anything wrong there, but banks have preconceived notions. I want them to meet some of these people, right? Because when you meet these people, it's hard not to want to help them, you know, um, and it's a majority of people, you know, so, so I think to me, the surprise was, um, you know, just, just, just opening up this whole world and then meeting people like you and your network and, you know, how everyone is literally like, oh, that's really interesting. I see how you can help this other person and they're willing to, you know, to do that, you know. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that story. It makes me think that, you know, I forget exactly what the line is, but it's like behind every business is a person or, mm -hmm. or there, there's people there. And, you know, for me, one of my greatest joys since getting into cannabis has been my, my opportunity, my great privilege to be able to share the stories of cannabis entrepreneurs. You know, it's essentially what I do on this show and what I've done in my book, but, you know, it's something I've done even before then, because, you know, as I got into the space seven years ago, there was no, it was very difficult to find out about any of any of the entrepreneurs here. And, and I think, you know, as kind of as a, I guess, as a nerd, you know, as a business entrepreneurship nerd, I, I think, wow, what a fascinating, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity to see this amazing industry be built in some ways. And, you know, there's, it, it doesn't just happen. You know, it's easy to see the headlines and, and think, oh yeah, the money, the this, the that. But behind all that, there's there's an entrepreneur somewhere, there's a person somewhere who's putting in the work, who's putting in the blood, sweat, and tears. And I completely agree with you. It's it's powerful and transformative for especially for outsiders to see that, you know, and um I I have more to say about that, but maybe I'll, I'll save that till till later. I want to ask you another question, which is what's a common misconception about cannabis banking that you know is not true? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I think one of the holdout common misconceptions is that everything is still cash, right? Like that, that people are sticking cash, you know, in a safe or their, in their mattress or whatever. Um, I think that we have, um, this is a rough count, but there's about 80 financial institutions doing THC banking across the country, probably about 500 to 1,000 doing hemp and CBD in some fashion, whether it's just, you know, toe in the water. Um, any of the data that you look at from sort of SARS or government data is, is not really correct. It's not unique in the way that they look at that data. But the point is, is um, there's enough banks now where people are getting a bank account. It's now about sort of enriching that. And so I think if Safe Banking Act provides a provision for Visa MasterCard transactions, that'll be a really good thing. There'll be less cash, um, but, but it's not an all cash um, situation. In what, you know, th this is actually probably mostly progressed by the bankers themselves. They think, oh, this is a big cash thing. Or, oh, I heard, and you know, <laughs> this is another funny one, is I heard uh, you have to actually physically launder the cash, like make it smell better because these cannabis guys are like sticking it in a safe with their bud. And so it smells like, you know, and it's like, you know, maybe in one case that's happened somewhere, I don't know, but there's these funny rumors that like exist, right? Um, so, you know, I think that's the number one thing um, that, that, I, that I think isn't really correct. Um, not to say that some people aren't sitting on pile of cash, but most have found a way to, to get that cash deposited in some institution, you know? That's amazing. The actual <laughs> washing, 
getting the yeah. smell of the cannabis off the ring that's incredible I haven't heard that yeah. one before that's probably just bsa officers loving little little dad jokes right i get to <laughs> actually money, money launder so yeah what's your sense of the safe banking act and and us seeing some kind of significant shift in in you know federal policy as it relates to cannabis banking yeah so um i, I like to remind people you, you know, there's a there's a simple thing that happens when you sign up for a bank account, right? Um, let's just say as a consumer, if you sign up online for a bank account and they send you an e-statement without asking for your permission, there's a federal regulation against that, right? That says you have to have a paper statement. And it's very specific. Right. I mean, there's like probably three pages of how you have to do this, right? There are no regs for cannabis banking. There is only what they call guidance and it's very light, you know? So so the big problem we have is that banks who want to get off the sidelines to do this don't know how to, how to be compatible or how to, um, how, to, how to stay in the lines and how to, how to have a conversation with their examiner, which is going to happen six months or every year. And I don't know if you recently saw this, but there was a local credit union, and I won't mention their names, but they got one of the first marijuana enforcement actions, which essentially means the examiner came in and said, what are you doing? They weren't doing anything really, um, according to the, the action. And it scares all of the rest of them to go, whoa, 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 I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this, right? Um, so with the Safe Banking Act, what we're talking about is actually coming through and acknowledging you know, from the federal government to state levels that this is a legal product and that it can be banked. Right, and a couple of different permission uh, provisions in there. Also, I think I understand there's some um, IRS provisions as well that'll really help, you know, in terms of um, deductions and so forth. But from the banking side, if regs can be created, then banks know how to bank it, and they will go bank it. Right? Um, you're still going to have your holdouts. Don't expect 100% of the banks in the country to bank it. They're going to have, you know, some who feel like it's a morality issue, some who feel like, you know, it, it still is sort of war on drugs, whatever. Right? Those guys are just not going to jump on the bandwagon or jump into this, but you know, ultimately we're looking for regs so that they can follow the regs. And when the examiner comes in and says, show me where you did this, hopefully they'd open up risk out and say, yep, here's all of Mike's business. Here's every communication. Here's everything we did. You know, we're not DEA. Like the bank is not DEA. We have to remind the banks they're not DEA, right? It's not their job to enforce whether Mike's doing everything perfectly and so forth, but they have to take reasonable, you know, steps to make sure you're not money laundering and that you're not providing product to children and some of those things, right? And so, um, so I think that's the big thing with Safe Banking Act. Plus, I think if Visa MasterCard get involved, um, you know, they are already processing marijuana transactions, not legally, um, but they are processing and collecting quite a bit of money. Um, I mean, I was in Las Vegas and there was a very big dispensary that had a Visa MasterCard. They do that by jumping outside international or, or, or washing those transactions. But, you know, because technically Visa MasterCard is supposed to be shutting those down. But overall, I think that's a big inhibitor we have right now is, is just taking, you know, payment commerce, right? So when those things happen, if that comes through St. Banking Act, we're going to see a lot of banks, a lot of my investors that aren't savvy will come to me and go, well, that means you don't have a business anymore. There's no compliance to be had. Well, I think there's not really compliance to be had when you can walk into Walgreens and show an ID and, and, and pick up your THC and walk out when it's basically like alcohol, right? Um, and you know, you still have to have a license to be a, you know, to, Walgreens still has have a license to sell you alcohol. So there's still elements of that. But we're a ways away from there. And so when, when Safe Banking Act happens, what it's going to do is it's going to cause a lot of banks, more than the 80 that are involved now, probably several hundred to a thousand who jump in. And we're going to see this interesting shift, right? These banks who are still charging $2,000 for a checking account, who aren't doing lending, who aren't doing these different services, they're going to have to deal with new um, supply being added to the demand of, of businesses wanting bank accounts, right? And the demand of New York and New Mexico and, you know, all these states essentially coming online. So, you know, you're going to see this, I think, a better commoditization of banking for, for, for THC, especially. Hemp and CBD is starting to move that way already. Um, but yeah, and then that's what I'll be excited to see is I'll be excited to take regs and then put them in our system and literally make those programs work. And when the examiner comes in and says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to find out where you're not doing your thing. They can literally just say, go for it, right? Here's everything you need. Just like on a, on a mortgage, the, you know, they look at a mortgage and they go, well, did Mike have income? Did you double check? He still had a job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's all here. Okay. You know, good. Then there's nothing for me to, to beat you up on. That's going to be the difference. Um, and, and I do think there's a lot of, I mean, since the announcements, since um, even before the announcement of State Banking Act, since the alignment, there's already, you know, 10 times the bank interest um, coming our way. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I'm hearing, 
I don't know, at least on my end, I, I, it seems people are pretty optimistic that we're going to see the banking get pushed through this year. And then again, you, you know, uh, Schumer had his very bullish statements recently in Politico that he's going to introduce some comprehensive reform measures and, and kind of force a vote. So, you know, I, I would be pleasantly surprised to see that happen. And, you know, I've always, <laughs> well, not always, in recent, recent years, I've been a jaded New Yorker more on these things, but, but in, in the early days, and now again, I'm, I'm of the opinion that these big changes happen faster than most people expect. And I think yeah. we're at this, you know, I, I, I think we're at a big turning point here now beyond New York going, New Mexico, Virginia's right around the corner. I, I, I can only imagine the momentum accelerating. So, you know, I, I think it's an exciting time. And, and I agree with you, you know, there's going to be even more bank interest and even more need for the compliance and, and uh, you know, as more banks get involved, if guidance is offered or, or more than just guidance, then, you know, there's going to be even more of a need for, for a tool like what Risk Scout provides. So I, I think you're, you're in a good place as far as I can tell. Uh, yeah, yeah, I that, agree. <laughs> that being said, uh, I want to shift gears into, into some coaching and ask cool. you, Justin, what is your biggest business buzzkill roadblock or challenge these days man that is a great question so so we're small right we're 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 doing well but we're a small team and you know i don't know any entrepreneur honestly who's like yeah i got plenty of people you know don't you know i'm sitting here twiddle my thumbs right um if you got more people you're doing more but you know for us um i guess one of the things that i didn't anticipate um you know, in, in, the, in the company was just how much education, um, you know, and proper education of the industry was necessary. So, so again, to sell to a bank, um, you're not going to find the bank at the MJA biz conference, right? You're, you're going to find them at the banker conference. And so they want to go and sometimes they go, but for the most part, they look to us to say, Hey, what's changing? What are these things? Like, um, just a great example. I've answered the Delta A question about, you know, 20 times in the last two weeks. Right. You know, just like, well, is it is it part of THC? Is it different? What's the DEA say? You know, and so there's all this this mix. And look, a lot of these are open questions, and they're not easy, right? Um, regulatory changes and things. But I think overall, for me, what I struggle with is, do we hire, um, you know, a cannabis expert, right? Someone who's been in the space and kind of work, um, you know, on on our staff, or do we partner with someone? But but I really think that these banks are eager to learn, and I do not want to be a poor shepherd of information or a poor shepherd of the industry. Um, I'm a listener and then a helper. I'm not a, I'm not going to go out and, and lead something that I don't have all the information on. Right. So I really want to help banks understand the space. Um, and so some are asking me, what conferences do I go to? How do I get involved? And, you know, and so I can hook up, you know, those kind of things, but I guess my question would be thinking about a small company, you know, about 15 people we have right now um, focus on helping banks and, and um, credit unions and insurers and merchants really understand this space. Um, you know, what, what sort of thoughts do you have around how we can really help education? Is this something we contract? Is this something we, you know, kind of invest in now? You know, like, I guess you understand the challenge, but how do I, how do I, how do I solve this? Or how do, what would you be your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have, you know, it's very interesting because no, I'm going to, I'm going to step outside of my normal, my normal MO here because you know, my normal kind of thing, I would ask you a bunch of questions and blah, 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 but I'm, I'm going to do something radical today. I'm going <laughs> right. to offer a suggestion because I, I feel strongly that I have at least one good answer of a, of a cost-effective way to execute this, you know, that's going to be lean, efficient, impactful, and ultimately help grow your business. And it's this, I, I am... I wonder if you can put together like a virtual cannabis summit for bankers and for, you know, just only for your intended audience. And I like this format a lot because 
you don't have to, you know, we live in this virtual Zoom world right now. And so, and you don't have to have all the answers yourself, right? There's a lot of stuff that you already know where people are already coming to you for this stuff. And then you could pull in a few other experts or resources where they provide some good information. And look, obviously this, this whole education piece is it's an ongoing battle as I'm sure you're aware in cannabis, there's always more to learn. And so what I'm hearing from you and why I had this idea, two things. One is I got so sick of people asking me the same questions about getting into the cannabis business and how to get started that I just wrote a book on it and said, don't ask me these questions, go get the book. It's on Amazon. You can go get the book. But, but so, you know, when I, when I hear you saying 20 people are asking you the same question, I immediately think, all right, like, you have to have some kind of system to disseminate content where you're not, you know, because t- time is limited. You can't be answering the same question 20 times. And, and if that happens every month, it's like, that's, it's, it's no good. So th- my, my thought was, can you pull together? And, and, and my assumption, based on what I heard, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is that for a lot of these folks, it, it's that kind of getting started piece, just kind of getting them up to speed. And so that's why I really like the summit thing, because it's like this kind of beginner intro type content isn't really going to change all that much. Yes, maybe a few nuances. Yes, maybe things will evolve. But I think if you can create some kind of evergreen digital resource that's going to get your target person, whether that's a bank compliance officer or whoever it may be, that's going to give them that kind of all-in-one done-for-you solution yeah. where it's just enough to get them started, just enough to, to get those, I'm going to characterize them as annoying questions off your plate. And then it at the same time establishes your credibility as, hey, you're the resource, you got to Hey, you you want to learn about this stuff? Go talk to Justin. Go go seek out Risk Scout. I think it could turn into a repeatable, high functioning marketing funnel for you if you set it up the right way. And I don't think it would be terribly difficult or expensive for you to put it together because sure. if you if you had to take one of these people, whether it's a bank compliance officer or, or whoever it may be. And, and give them the, the kind of intro one-on-one, walk them through the process, answer all their questions. Like how long would that really take? Yeah, so, so I, I've done some thinking about the knowledge journey from a bank who comes fresh, you know, whether that's six phone calls an hour long or that's six hours with us somewhere, right, in person. Um, there's sort of this four to six hour period, I think that before they get to this place. And here's the kicker is it's four to six hours per bank, right? But also I would say maybe 50% have a, have a even though they're there, 50% have a threshold for like, I'm gonna go do something in the next 12 months. The other 50% are just like, what I've learned is I don't wanna do this, right? It's not in our wheelhouse, I, it's too much effort or what have you, right? Um, and that's just the nature of it. And that'll change as you know more commoditization happens, but you know, it's, it's a good, really good point. And I think um, I really like what you said you know, we were, I told you earlier, we we're kind of doing these like showcase videos of the, of the, of the, I would love to get some of these partners who do testing, who do cultivation, who, you know, process and have them, you know, speak, right. And share, you know, what's going on, share, share some good stories, share some challenging stories with the space. Right. Uh, maybe even ultimately some lawmakers and some others who can see what the banks are looking for. You know, I think that would be, I think you're, you're right on with, I don't have to be the full expert on that. Like I'm not, I don't know every detail of the industry, but if I can bring the team together or the people together that can answer those questions. And then I, I really like sort of the, the, you know, not the exhibit hall kind of model, but the, the training model, but then round table model, right. Get banks together who all want to start cannabis lending. Right. You know, I don't know how much you know about cannabis lending, but it's tough, right? Like there are challenges with federal bankruptcy court right now. And so, you know, get them together so they can talk about how to make those terms work, how to not be a payday loan for, you know, this business who needs $100,000 to unlock $500,000, right? 
Um, and I do work with some great lenders and some banks on that, but I think it's important for them to get together and talk to each other, but they need a moderator. They need a facilitator to, to bring that together. Cause otherwise it's like, again, guns are pointed. All right, Mike, are you trying to steal my cannabis secrets, you know, at my bank and what I'm doing, you know, and, and, and they really do want to work together. And, and I worked for a company called Q2 that was um, online banking. And as soon as we started grouping our, our, we had these user conferences. So we started grouping our banks in like-minded either region or same backend software systems or, or sort of bank style, There's a lot of different bank types. Um, they just, it just started to, you know, blow up in terms of the things they were able to come up with um, versus sort of being a face in the crowd. Right. Um, I think it's a great idea, man. I would love to do it. Now I'm thinking now, do I get out Northeast? Do I get out, you know, and do a couple of these? I mean, now the pandemic's sort of starting to, you know, get to a place where we can do more events. Can I do that? Or do I start kind of a virtual thing? But I, this is exciting. Nice. And I, I, my sense of it is again, if, if, if you're spent, if that journey is four to six hours, right. And if you can instead, if you can record that, right. If you could serve it up to them on a silver platter and say, you know, Hey, Mr. Or Mrs. Banker, Mr. or Mrs. Compliance Officer, here it is, you know, go through it at your own pace. If you have questions, get in touch with our team, we'll, we'll help you out. And then by the way, you know, once you're ready to go, we have this software that's going to make it really easy for you. I think that could potentially save you a ton of time. And what I love about the content piece is you create it once and it, and it works for you forever. Right. And yeah. just like code content is like code in that way, sure. uh, the scalability, even just hearing the four to six hours, right? Like you pull together five to 10 people to speak on their piece of it and to give some insight and you bring in some other compliance folks that, are, that have already gone through this process, right? That people you've helped through and that are on the other side of it. And you just get them to come do, you know, I'm not going to say outsource all of the work, right? But you, yeah. you facilitate it, put it together and serve it up to, to the next wave of banks coming into it. I, I think that could be hugely valuable. And I feel like, honestly, I, I'm going to, now I'm, now I'm getting really crazy, but yeah. I feel like you could put that together and launch it before the end of the month, if you really wanted to, and you can bring in bankers from, from all over the country and compliance people from all over the country, as well as those businesses, the actual clients of, of the banks. I, I like this because I think it's lean. I think it's scalable and I think it will deliver results. So no coaching, just a pure suggestion idea, which I, I trust that y you can take the reins and capitalize on if you wish. Yeah, look, I, I, I love it. I think first of all, it does more with less, which is super important right now. But I think the other important thing that's been nagging on me is, um, you know, I've got to run a business, right? I've got a bunch of different job roles. I've got to, I've got to, you know, keep my, my people pay. You got to keep my customers happy. You got to keep the businesses happy. But at the end of the day, there's a purpose for me. And I think about it every time I think about my dad, who's getting in the hemp industry is, you know, I don't want to see him get ripped off. I don't want to see him have bad experience with his bank that he's been with for 30 years. Right. There's a purpose to that. And, and, it, and it comes into education and doing that bridge. And so it, 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 it eats at me that I'm not able to spend a lot of time doing it. Cause I probably would just be out doing all this all the time if I wasn't running a software company. Right. Um, but I like that it crosses both paths and this is part of what we do. And it's part of, you know, it's part of a new market. It's part of helping people understand each other and listen to each other. And, um, and then it all works out in a great spot because businesses get to build a relationship with the bank. They get to open up more products that they need. The banks are feeling like they've got a business that's, um, you know, someone they're serving in their community. Right. Um, there was this really heartbreaking mess um, um, article that I read a, a few years back when I first got started with Risk Out, and it was um, it's actually I think one of the previous banks I worked with in a previous life, but they were up in um, in New Jersey, and um, you can still search this article, I believe, but they were a family Christmas tree farm, a seasonal farm, but they do Christmas trees in December, you know, um, pumpkins in October, and uh, they had a half acre of hemp, and you know at the time you can buy ground up hemp on Amazon, it's not like it's you know, that big a deal, but, um, they were letting people, you know, collect fresh hemp and put it in their coffee, do whatever they're going to do with it. But nothing was being, you know, created even in smokables or anything on any kind of edge. And the story was they called they were called into their bank. They had a relationship for 30 years and they cut them a check said, you know, after you finish your coffee, you're no longer with the bank. Here's your check. 
and we recalled your twenty thousand dollar loan that we just lent you and um you know they're like what what do we do wrong and and then they had to struggle and they finally found um you know banker credit union to help them at the end but it's just you know I don't think the banks really want to be in that position, right? I think they want to figure this out and they want to help community businesses, right? Um, so, so it's a purposeful thing to create the education, to create the the bridge here that that connects them. And um, you know, who better than to me? I'm already in both sides of it. So, you know, um, personally for the family and and you know on the software side with uh, with the banks. And so, you know, it's a great opportunity to to help. I dig it. I think I, I agree with you. Who better than you? And, and if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? So Yeah, well, you know, I'm giving you credit, all right? So with the first one we do, there's a big banner. And uh, if I grab some of your books, I'll put them in the back. But I'm giving you total Mike credit. Mike, Mike suggested this, you know, it's a home run. All right, man. Just don't forget about me when, uh, you know, five years from now. That's that's all I ask. <laughs> no problem, man. No problem. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But um. No, awesome. I would love to see you put this together. And if you do it, let me know. I will introduce banks and bankers from the Northeast. That would be awesome. an easy, easy thing for me to do. I'm sure they'd be happy to spread the knowledge. And, you know, I think to your point, the banks and bankers and compliance people, they they want to see the businesses succeed. They want to get the job done. And I think the ones that are really open-minded and paying attention really understand that it's only a matter of time until they're going to be banking cannabis and hemp businesses anyway. So, you know, at least my bias is why delay the inevitable? If you, yes, it might be a little, a little bit of a pain to get it up and running. And there's a few extra hurdles if you do it today, but you're going to be doing it eventually. You might as well. I, I can almost guarantee there's someone at your bank that cares about cannabis or is into cannabis that would be happy to spearhead that effort. And so I don't know, I, I think there's a lot there, but I'll leave it at that and ask you, Justin, what was the, what was your biggest insight from our conversation? Man, um, you know, I think the biggest insight is, is, um, you know, taking away that I, it's, it's a reminder, I guess I should say, it, it's reminding me that I have to stay lean, stay scalable, keep, keep with the mission. Um, but I think that, that we're going the right direction, but it, to continue to find these ways to do more with less, to be able to, to bridge these gaps. And, you know, I guess kind of coming in the call, I'm thinking, should we even be doing the education piece? I mean, you know, kind of what we do is kind of out there, but getting that feedback from you and hearing, um, you sort of resonate on and help us figure out a way to do that. I think that's a great insight for me. Um, you know, I, I love talking to, I do a lot of bank podcasts. I do a lot of bank interviews and, and it's fun. There's that side of it. There's the education spot, but I really love, I love at your virtual happy hour, getting to meet all the different people that were involved there. And um, I will say um, this is not a plug, but we have a free service. If they're interested in banking, having struggling with cannabis loans, insurance, any of that, um, I will point them in the right place. Not necessarily my customers, anyone that I know that's kind of in your state or a place to help. Um, they can come and, and visit us and I'll help be happy to get them in the right place. You know, um, I believe in that karma, man. I believe, you know, that if you help people, it'll, it'll come back, you know, and, you know, and, and, and it's just, it's just rewarding. It's one of those things that you do and you like to see people get what they need, you know? So if anybody in the, I mean, I know your space is mostly cannabis. So if they are interested in any financial services or struggling, they're happy to, happy to share our knowledge and our network. Awesome. And I appreciate that. And once again, is, is the best place to go for that riskscout.com? If you're a bank, uh, merchant processor insurance, riskscout.com is the best place for you to go. We have another brand um, called Veraleaf, V-E-R-I-L-E-A-F.io, which is a website that's designed to help businesses get prepared to go get their financial services. Um, we have some participating members that are on our Riskout platform that makes it easy, but again, I don't care if they're not on our risk out platform. I will point you to good banks and people that we know um, and, and lenders that are doing the, the right stuff. So um, depending on your situation, we just ask that people go through a little, little match.com questionnaire so we can figure out where to put them. Because one thing I've learned, um, actually, I've got about 15 Wix notices right now since we've been talking. No kidding. Um, you know, these businesses are, are hurting and it's like the fourth time that they're reaching out to that. They've been, been looking through banks four times and they reach out to us and I don't want to waste their time. Right. So I'm trying to get a sense of, okay, if you're doing smokable hemp, here's someone who will do that with you. If you're doing THC, you know, um, in Oklahoma, here's a great bank for that, right? So 
that's all I ask is that they, you know, submit some information and we'll get them connected to the right person. No fee. I get asked that all the time. We don't charge anything. Um, you know, and we'll try to tell you as much as we can about what the banks charge because they will all have their different fee schedules and their different processes. Awesome. That's a fantastic service. And, you know, I, I applaud you for offering that as a community service. And I think it's definitely a huge problem. People ask me all the time about how do I get my merchant processing? How do I get banked? How do, all this stuff. So I, it's wow. That's interesting. 14 in, in just this hour. So, yeah, yeah. I was just going to see, I was going to show you this cause it's uh, it just sits and buzzes on my phone and it's just an obvious it's a, it's a good thing. I actually, when I mostly, I, I can, I go and like chat with, I don't know, the names probably aren't really yeah. recognizable, but all those are inbox leads from, yeah, just the last, last hour. So, nice. um, and different stuff, merchant processing, insurance, banking, lending, you know, mostly around that world. Nice. Awesome. Well, I'm going to let you go and get back to all those folks, take care of those leads and, you know, once you, if you end up doing this summit thing, I, I suspect you're going to have even more leads to deal with. But anyway, Justin, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to sit with me on the podcast and chat and share about the work you're doing. I think it's awesome work and I, I wish you nothing but growth and success for your business. And I, I look forward to getting an update one day when you, when you, actualize this idea in in some capacity so please keep me informed yeah i'll absolutely keep you in the loop i also want to thank you for the insight and the coaching i really appreciate it um you know would love to love to connect more i'm really looking forward to more of your events and actually just thank you for doing that i mean i think these kind of things that you do getting people connected in the network is what makes the difference and uh you know like i said i think you said it earlier in surprise i'm happy that everyone that i've met so far has been genuinely interested in helping each other and you're the epitome of that. So thank you so much. Ah, thank you. That's very kind of you, man. Well, thanks, Justin. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. The Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. The Cannabis Business Coach.